And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple, the head of DS Ex Machina, the man who gave me the white flower gag, and the... And the man who is bringing affinity to our, to our shelves everywhere, the one and only Chris Diaz. Hey, How brother. Doing? How you doing today, man? I'm good. I'm good. So now I I um I I ended up looking through it and um I w I will get I will give you my I will give you your due props for getting this thing funded in an hour. Thank you. Um. But to go into the humble beginnings, as it were, what what um pr what prompted this particular setup when it came to the affinity idea? Well, um, originally, uh, I had walked out of the film Cloud Atlas, and I had read the book already, so I kind of knew how the book had staged its storytelling, and then I saw how the movie staged its storytelling, and I'm also you know seeing other stories of multi-narratives you know we have the fountain and Babel and other stories and we've seen stories obviously most high fantasy stories we've seen uh, put on television like game of thrones are multi-narratives we're following several people right but they're all always in the same world right and something like the fountain is potentially placed in three different time periods but they're you're you're kind of left unsure whether or not two of them are real uh, Cloud Atlas is very much real realities, but there's also some evidence that some of them might not be real. And I thought, hey, that's an interesting idea. What do, I wonder if you could do that in a game. And so I, I challenged Nick, my artist, uh, hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of three different, but instead of doing time periods, or at least um, have, creating three distinct settings that have the exact same uh, titles, same similar iconography, uh, some similar themes, but be completely different. Like one would be high fantasy, one would be steampunk, and one would be space opera. Mm -hmm. And every time he draws an illustration of a character, that same that same face has to be on on uh, drawn in a different s suit in an, in the other two, right? And mm -hmm. so he, he whenever he would draw something, he'd have to draw it three different ways. And he thought it was an incredible challenge. And then we put and then we thought, great, let's do it. And then we sat on it for four years. Um, Maybe it could have been six, five or six, five or six years. We we sat on it, and I kept on thinking one of these days. I had all these projects that I wanted to 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 work on, and Ultra Modern was a way when I when I did the Kickstarter in 2019. Ultra Modern was a way to dusting off a lot of old ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a story called uh, Pathfinder, which was made in 1996, so it predates the other Pathfinder by quite a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, that turned into a, a module called Threshold, which is in Ultra Modern 5, the new version. And then I also had an old uh, cyberpunk story called Necropolis, which also goes back to my old homebrew page from the mid-90s. That became an adventure in Ultra Modern. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, maybe I should have Affinity as a stretch goal. Maybe it'll be as a stretch goal. So I launched, I put it as a stretch goal. I didn't think we'd actually hit it. We blew past it like the day before we ended the campaign. So the great and I spent, while Nick was doing all the artwork for Ultra Modern, I spent most of uh, 2019 and 2020 writing Affinity. And it was just planned to be about 100 pages each. Because I already had most of Pathfind, uh, so most of Paradise. Mm -hmm. Because I ran the game with my friends, but they didn't want to run to two other settings. They just wanted to run a high fantasy. And then the game ended up collapsing about four sessions in. The group kind of fractured for the first time in 11 years. We kind of broke up. And we never got the, back, the band back together, unfortunately. So I had all this continent written for Paradise, but I didn't have anything for the other two. So I started writing Paradise and came to about 175 pages. So I went, okay, so that's a bit long. Um, I'm probably going to have to make an excuse, maybe have to cut some content, bring it down to 120, and then make sure the other two are in that same one. So I write Conestoga next. And Conestoga, I knew I wanted to create this very unique modular-based crafting system that was very much inspired by Dead Space 3. I was a big fan of Anthem, so I wanted to throw some Anthem mechs and flying mechs in there as well. Mm -hmm. And I was great. And then they got to 205 pages. I was like, oh, that sucks. So I'm going to have to make sure that... Now, Conestoga's the aberrant. I can't let 
Taurus be more than 175 pages. So I wrote Taurus, which was steampunk. And I had all these cool steampunk weapons I wanted to throw in, inscription system, this whole magic system based on playing cards. And it got to 213 pages. So I said, okay, I'm going to have to go back to Paradise and add more content. But at this point, the, the art budget for all three were, were, was not enough. It was enough for a 100-page book, but it wasn't enough for a 200-and-some-page book. Mm-hmm. So I figured, you know what? I was running a, I was close to running a Kickstarter for my board game, Naramata, and I'm thinking, you know what? I could just make this thing now as a black-and-white version, satisfy those people, and then come out with a color version. But then, like, I, I got to make sure I, 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 I serve these people correct. So I decided, you know what? I'm not going to release them before Naramata. I'm going to sit on it and then release both versions as a Kickstarter and see if we can get the additional money to make it. And at no point did a single person who backed Affinity back in 2019, it was part, part of Ultramodern, complained. Because they're still getting a black and white version that they paid for. Mm-hmm. And, I'll, and about half of them have, have paid for the upgrade to get the newer version. And obviously I was able to tap my Ultramodern audience and everybody who's uh, been following me for the last 12 or 13 years. And so, yeah, I exploded. So now we get to do uh, Affinity as it should be done as this beautiful color um, three-set box set. Yeah. Now, I will, I will admit that when it comes to this particular version of Affinity for me personally, I am go- I'm going in blind because I didn't find out about um, Ultra Modern 5 until it was already um, available for everybody. Right. Like the the Kickstarter had had came and had came and went with me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't need, 2019. I don't think I I may have been I may have been doing the Kickstarter spotlight segment on on my channel, but um, obviously I can't get to everyone at everyone every week. <laughs> well, there's so many five E ones out now. There's like a half a dozen really big ones as we as as we're recording this. Yeah. Um. But first, let's let's. Let's tackle the um, let's tackle the genres with with all three of them, um, Contestoga, Taurus, and Paradise. Um, yeah. Now you admit you had mentioned now with two of them you admit you had mentioned the inspirations for what you want to do with some aspects. You mentioned um, that's you mentioned Dead Space. You mentioned Anthem. But when it comes to the when it comes to the when it comes to the uh, genres that you're going for. The one that I want to focus on in this question is steampunk because that's one that can have a lot of variance for people in terms of what draws them in. What what do you see as the appeal with a genre like steampunk? Well, the the irony with me is that I have often have criticized and openly uh, condemned people using the ter- the term steampunk. Um, because remember the whole idea of steampunk is it was a it was a, it was a playoff of cyberpunk. Cyberpunk mm-hmm. was was coined, uh, the, the genre had existed for a while, but then somebody coined it in a short story, uh, in the mid '80s, and then everything retroactively became cyberpunk, which I never really agreed with. I mean, you create a genre, it should start there and move forward. I mean, mm-hmm. no one no one calls Die Hard a speed clone, right? No, uh, you know it, it, it's it's I don't know how it works retroactively, but then somebody has a joke then. Uh, who, actually, it was uh, Jeter, uh, an author, mm-hmm. and uh, he coined the term uh, steampunk as a playoff of cyberpunk. And then a few people started writing work that was in that, and there were certain things that were definitive of steampunk. I objected quite heavily with, with that massive retroactive inclusion, where suddenly everything that was in that genre, so they claimed all of this, all of these people who were fanboys for steampunk grabbed all of this and said, this is ours now. And I said, no, it's not. You don't get 19, you don't get 18th century speculative science fiction. That's, that's 18th century science fiction. It's not mm-hmm. steampunk. They weren't intentionally trying to create steampunk. That's what they thought the future would be like in the 1800s. So H.G. Wells, the time machine, that's not steampunk. No. Right. It's, 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 a, it's, it's Victorian science fiction. It's a completely different genre. But mm-hmm. then they started including, uh, these other uh, genres, you know, far-fetched 1940s, uh, the, uh, popu- the, the, the Populex uh, vi- visual style from the 60s, what we thought the future would be like in the 50s, you know, that was suddenly included. And then it got so big, they realized, oh, we, it's too big, it's, it's too broad. But instead of just saying, no, no, steampunk is Victorian sci-fi, they just said, no, no, uh, 1940, that's diesel punk. And then 1950, that's atomic punk. And if it's a weird, and if it's in, in this age, it's, if it has biological biopunk, and I'm like, do, does anybody know what the word punk means? Because you're kind of not 
you're, you're, you're making excuses. So, I mean, most people say steampunk is Victorian retroactive technology, mm -hmm. but some people include the Wild West in there, but some don't. They say the, the, the Weird West is another genre, but a lot the steampunk like to include. Uh, I love Art Deco sci-fi. And I love playing with Art Deco sci-fi. And whenever someone calls it steampunk, I say it's not even close to being steampunk. You can call it atomic punk. Some people call it that. But I like the term Art Deco. It's a great yeah. visual style. So I've always had issues with steampunk. And exactly that, because there are so many other people's interpretations of what it actually is. Some people like including that weird West mm -hmm. element. And Taurus, for example, isn't set on Earth. It doesn't have a it, 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 it imitates the steampunk aesthetic. But it's not technically steampunk because it doesn't. It's not. In, it's not set on Earth. It's not. It's not set in a Victorian age. It doesn't have that Victorian aesthetic, and the technology exists the way it does because of logical reasons rather than just a far-fetched uh, kind of concept of people being able to produce high technology with steam. Mm -hmm. Personally, I've um, the big crit the big criticism I'd have I have had when it comes to. Well, uh, just to, just as a catch-all, I've, I've used the term tech punk when it comes to a lot when it comes to a lot of the subgenres in that sense. Um, is uh, is first off, a lot of people focusing more uh, more on the look of tech and not on the punk aspect. Um, yeah. Because when I when I think of punk, I think of I think of the very DIY attitude of it. You know, ev everything is customized. Everything is is um. Is mo is modded and kitted out. Um, yeah, the subculture, right? Mm -hmm. But, oh, but a lot of t but the bigger problem, and ste I'd say steampunk is, is is especially guilty of this with a lot of people, is the very low bar for what qualifies. Um, like a, for a lot of pe for a lot of people, steampunk begins and ends with just add gears and monocles. <laughs> And yeah, exactly. I um, I remember. I remember. I remember a long time ago, someone tried to ar someone tried to argue with me that the f that the first two Thief games count as um, steampunk. Yeah. And I don't. I don't. Qu I don't quite agree with that. Largely because yeah, there's def there's definitely some te there's definitely some of that technological elements, but the thing, the thing with say with something like Thief, which I I'm a huge fan of, or or similar um, games that are be that are bending genres is if you try and put them into one particular genre, you are um, pi you are pissing in the wind. Yeah. <laughs> um. Because the the idea that the idea that something can can encompass multiple genres is so, is um, something that a lot of people don't seem to quite grasp, and I've often used um, I often use console style RPGs as an as an example of this. Like the original, I'm a big fan of Final Fantasy, and the original entry in that series, you couldn't. Re you could try and qualify that as as high fantasy, but then you've got then you've got little bit little bits of tech that don't fit the traditional approach. I mean, you've got an airship in the fir in the first game in the series, and the term that I, the term that I've used instead is um, Gestalt fantasy. Right. You know, because you've got you instead of trying to draw from one particular style of fiction, it's drawing from a bunch of things and then just mit mashing it together. Um, right, and well, that, I, you, I think mm -hmm. you get the nail on the head. I think mm -hmm. that that's Final Fantasy has always have been about. Like pe people said, Final Fantasy about fantasy. I want fantasy. I'm like, have you seen the Final Fantasy games? They've never been hard fantasy. They've no. always been a blend of fantasy and some technological element. They've never gone full on steampunk. And I've always appreciated their tech, um, their technology being so weird and different in each volume. And sometimes it's been to the point where there's virtually no fantasy elements, like Final Fantasy VII. And then you have ones like Final Fantasy X, which have these fantastical fantasy elements blended with technology. Mm -hmm. uh, many ways, uh, people could say, like, even Affinity. Affinity is basically three different Final Fantasies in one volume because mm -hmm. there's a lot of Final Fantasy inspiration in all three volumes, kind of inadvertently, because I've played the game, so it's, it probably rubbed yeah. off on me somehow. Um, well, we are... We are a we are a collection of our of our inspirations, and art is never never comes out of a vacuum. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, but what? But I want to. Sh- I want to shift to to the to the idea to um, paradise now. Obviously, that's the more that's the fantastical end of of this particular. Um, I would call. I was gonna call it Trinity, but I'm pretty sure Onyx Path would probably yell at me again. <laughs> um, and that then I then I can rem- and if I well if I get yelled at I can just reply. So um, how's that how's that new Aeon book working out for you? <laughs> <laughs> um, but how did how did the idea of paradise for, first um, get started? Uh, well, like I said, all th- I started with the idea of all three settings having mm-hmm. different formats. Although, what they ended up being was different. Like Conestoga, I said was going to be on mm-hmm. a giant colony ship. It mm-hmm. was supposed to be a cylinder and then turned into a giant peanut uh, shortly uh, before we launched. Mm-hmm. And a Taurus was set on on a just a regular world. And then I realized that the gimmick of all three of them should be that all the world are manufactured, that they're artificial in some way. Uh, because if Conestoga is artificial and Paradise is artificial, then Taurus should be as well. And of course, it wasn't called Taurus; it was called something else. Mm-hmm. And so it became Taurus. So it became a giant donut, and then you had a giant peanut, and then Paradise is has always been this idea of this constructed world. I loved just the freakish visual of in Amethyst and a few other stories and other campaigns. I played with the idea of just strange things that don't seem to to that, that seem, don't seem to follow any logic mm-hmm. you know whether it be floating mountains i had a i had a planet that was held down by chains and just visuals like that and i i want you know i thought it was really cool and i remember this scene from uh from the dark crystal where the characters the character goes into to meet agra and there's this amazing model solar system mm-hmm. and uh whenever i see Orries, they never look this lavish. They never look that fantastic. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if that was actually how the world worked? If there was a giant arm that would connect to the world and one world would literally move across a chasm across the equator and it had another moon that was on a ring and then the entire thing was set in a giant spherical area with rings that moved around each other um, and that simulated star movement and, and the rising of the sun. And the whole thing was this just giant construct that contained a unique reality within that unique reality you could have magic mm-hmm. and then it it spiraled off from there and then as i wrote that one i had to write down all these things i was developing because everything i created in paradise would have to go into conestoga and taurus in some way yeah now when when you mentioned when you mentioned the whole structure thing one of something that immediately came to mind is you'd probably get a kick out of the manga blame i know of it i don't think i've seen it um it did. It did get made into an animated movie. I recommend not seeing that. Okay. Um, because blame is a is a very good is a very good manga to sit down and read. It's one that doesn't really translate to to um animation or to any to um any sort of live any sort of um. Any sort of live action or anything like that. Obviously, the live action would be too expensive, and, and and animation. the The issue is, it's a very massive um, travelogue kind of story. Right. A lot of it is about exploring this sit this city that is that is the size of the um of the Earth, of the Earth's orbit, the Earth's orbit's diameter. Okay. Like you're dealing, with, you're, it's big enough where moving between floors takes us takes um, several years, if not decades. <laughs> and because of that, because of that, it's one where the the uh, ideal situation to see it in is um, is re- is reading it in relative ambiance. You know, where 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 you're not having any distraction, you can just focus on what's in what's in front of you, and the pace is directed by how fast you're reading it. Um but when it comes to paradise, you've you've meant it mentions that you're putting in three new races. Can you what can you tell me about the races that you're adding? Um so every time I create a race I want it to be something that's somewhat unique. So mm-hmm. we have a couple. The first of all is one are these humans that are kind of godlike. They're kind of they've magically evolved themselves. They're called the Aegis and they're mm-hmm. basically present themselves as being godlike. 
Uh, we also have an extremely alien species called the Nagamji, which are kind of these nomadic species. They're as alien as I could try to make them and still make up a playable race. Uh, I played with that same idea in Ultra Modern, creating races mm -hmm. that were completely foreign and difficult to run. Uh, but that was original. And as we went through, and then we also had some stretch goals, we've, we're, we've added a few more. We've added um, a daemon, and daemon mm -hmm. is basically a a creature made of light that's moving among us, uh, concealed by being wrapped in type in some kind of human skin. That they look completely normal, but if you were to cut them, you would just see bright light come out. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so they're 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 ostracized and they're hiding because to expose them would probably bring about uh, their execution. And uh, well, we're well, also that well that thought. Um... Yeah, we've we've introduced a couple new races. One's called the Aegis, and the Aegis are basically a uh, they're they're a, they're a variant of a humanoid or human that have kind of artificially evolved themselves into being these magical godlike beings that kind of oppress everybody below. And so they're, they're a potential race. We have another one called the Nagamji. Nagamji are as alien as I can make an alien species while mm -hmm. still making them playable. Uh, they are bioluminescent. They have a strange uh, way of music and language. And they're very nomadic. They're kind of like, uh, you know, using the rather derogatory term, they're kind of like gypsies. Um, and then uh, we uh, have introduced a new race called Daemon as part of the stretch goal, which is uh, a species. Uh, they're basically beings of pure light that are mm -hmm. kind of wrapped in human skin so you don't know who they are, so they kind of live among you. They possess some supernatural abilities, but they can basically shed off their skin and they, become, they, they almost look like angels. But they're hiding in plain sight mm -hmm. because if they were to reveal themselves, uh, they would be ostracized, if not executed. Uh, we're also working on... Uh, there's a golem race, uh, Emmett Heim, uh, and w hopefully we will get to that stretch goal because mm -hmm. it's, 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 they are part of a much larger section, uh, expanding on golems and basically allowing people to create different types of golems. And so, yeah, that's, that's that one. And I think we might have another one coming as well. Cause there's about four or five, there's like four or five races now in each book. All right. And when it comes when it comes to the new when it comes to the new class, what can you tell me about that one? Is it leaning on the martial? Or are you leaning a bit as a uh, caster class, or is it going um, gish? Um, the the all the new classes, at least so far, have been uh, magic based because mm -hmm. uh, we offer a new uh, uh, spell casting system, and the spell casting system is based off of glyphs and. Um, uh, Something called Cryptions. It's mm -hmm. it's inspired by the Japanese. Uh, I can't remember the name now, but it's a, when they when they they, they they had this idea of writing the spells on a piece of paper and then oh, that Fuda. piece of paper. Thank you, and applying that to an object. So the entire system. They're at the class is called Abyssidarian. They mm -hmm. have an entire magic system based off of applying spells via these magical pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. They're a very different class because they they don't have the capacity of launching like fireballs they can't do uh, they can't do meteor swarms like they're not capable of doing that they have a much different type of magical system it's much more subdued but they can do things that other casters can't do they are able to animate uh, objects and animate creatures much lower and much more reliably than other classes uh, they can lay down traps really easily. They can mm -hmm. lay down debuffs and so forth. And they also have the capacity of of making and controlling golems uh, in a way that the Vanishing System doesn't touch at all. Like, there is no official 5e set of rules to teach, to, to show how people make a golem. Mm -hmm. They show you golems in Monster Manual, and they never actually want players to make them, so they don't give you the procedure to do them outside of the one magical item which you have to find, which is an artifact, which tells you how to create one. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, you can't. So it creates a situation where golems are extremely rare and extremely um, hard to create. But in this story with Abyssidarian, uh, if you're 1450th level, you can have a group of golems working for you. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah. And you also talked about, I'm guessing... I'm, I'm guessing because of what you mentioned regarding Golem, that ties into um, the fact that you've messed around with the rules with alchemy. Because yeah. a, com a common criticism I see with a, with a lot of people regarding Core 5e is crafting systems are woeful are woefully inadequate. Yeah. 
Yeah, so yeah, the alchemy rules are something I want to work on. It's also been folded into a stretch goal. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's kind of it creates the, the 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 way people are able to like within this setting. Once you establish rather arbitrary rules of how magic works within a setting, mm-hmm. you kind of have to follow to conclusion. So Amethyst did it. Uh, it, it Amethyst made compromises to make the Vancian system work. If I was to do Amethyst now, I would probably say, you know what, I'm going to be 100% Amethyst and not make that compromise and, and bend a new system rather than bend Amethyst. Mm-hmm. Uh, with these, I was said, you know what, I'm not going to have to bend it if I have to create these rules. Magic can only be constructed by pa- pieces of paper. Okay, so how do you do potions? How do you do salves? Okay, I'm going to have to create a whole new system now to make that work. Mm-hmm. And that became the whole system, the idea of in the setting, you cr- you can either cast a spell by applying this sigil, which is kind of a cheat code of the universe, onto something, or you create some magical concoction. And that encompasses uh, how to make golems, how to make salves, how to make oils, how to make potions. So the whole thing is in there. And also making it so it can be done in a way that's fun and fast and interesting so a player can go down that path without feeling like it's a dead end mm-hmm. and even with now par now paradise the the sub the subtitle that's on the page is dungeon crawling in, inside is inside a um, structure now even though I even though I make a living pissing off grognards um <laughs> when it comes to when it comes to the whole dungeon crawling idea, is is Paradise designed as 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 some sort of mega dungeon, or are we ch- are we talking just standard dungeon crawling? Uh, so I use that term as a way of of pulling in interest. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I don't run dungeon crawls. Uh, I run cam- I I run open world campaigns, like narrative based. Open world is in, it's out in the open, it's not always enclosed. Uh, I very, very rarely run dungeon delving, and I don't run uh, adventures where the objective is to get levels and get gear and more magic and kill things. It's about experiencing the story. Mm-hmm. It's about Mass Effect, not Neverwinter. It's a, it's about wanting that story and not thinking about the mechanical benefits. So I, I put that in there, so because it, it's the easiest way to convey a thought um without confusing people too much technically the giant dungeon is conestoga conestoga is a giant dungeon because that's what conestoga is it's a giant massive spacecraft it's just one colossal dungeon Mm -hmm. and you know there are cities but the cities are small it's mostly dungeon right and so it's 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 an interesting inversion but paradise you know i'm not saying that Obviously, most people, it, it's a traditional fantasy. And because it's more traditional fantasy than the other two, mm-hmm. you use the, lingu- the, the lingo people will understand and say, well, you're basically, it's a, it's a dungeon delving fantasy adventure, but you're in a giant alien megastructure. Mm-hmm. Now, move, moving into, um, moving into ca- um, Contestoga, and I, I always, I always keep thinking that there's an extra A in there for some reason. I don't know why, but... <laughs> I had I had to stop myself a couple of times and not call it Contestanoga. I don't I don't. And I and my my way of trying of trying to keep myself from doing it is just thinking of contest and toga. Yeah. Um, well, it's 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 an old it's an old I think I can't remember if it's 16th or 17th century. It's just a term for covered wagon, mm-hmm. and it's actually named after an old adventure that I ran. Um, in the 90s. So once again, I'm pulling ideas from my old homebrew campaigns forward. Mm-hmm. Now, with this with this one, you ha- you obviously have the tagline of Mecha Battle for control over a um, spa- over a spacecraft. Now, given how given how you've you've mentioned that all these are taking place in these massive constructed um, superstructures, how big is this spa- is this particular spacecraft? I think it's eight or nine thousand kilometers across. I think I because uh, I remember it used to be five, but I mm-hmm. think I moved it to be eight or nine thousand kilometers across. And Taurus, I think it's about the same. I think when it comes to real estate, I think Paradise is the biggest mm-hmm. of the three uh, of the three settings, and then Taurus is second. And then Conestoga 
A hot dog is a weird one because the Taurus uh, has a large space because it's a donut, but you never leave the space. Where Conestoga is a giant peanut, but it's the 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 setting is 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 the interior, not the exterior. So you're not living on top of a giant peanut. You're inside the giant peanut for most of it. But mm -hmm. it's about so square footage. I would say Conestoga might be the largest one, but because I haven't done the whole mass to level ratio, I haven't done the math. Mm -hmm. But it's 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 obviously it's a very large structure because it's. It's it's bigger than the United States, mm -hmm. and and uh, it's just and with and with a lot more floors than the than the U.S. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> now when now um that one obviously is go is going to be introducing its own its own batch of races and um what could you t what could you tell me about those? Well, unlike. Uh, the other settings, which have mostly magic, the magical mm -hmm. ratio in Conestoga is about 80 20. So it's mostly sci fi and not as much magic compared mm -hmm. to Paradise, which is 80% magic, 20% technology. And as a result, there's no magical races. It's all alien life forms. So you have humans, and then you have a, a race of bird people, you know, avian bird people called the Scrim. Mm -hmm. Then you have a hive insectoid race uh, called Scabs, which is a rather derogatory term because they don't have a language of their own outside of clicking. And then there is kind of a gray elf-like race of uh, creatures called endolons uh, who are known for intelligence, agility, but they also can't breathe oxygen, so they have to be in uh, pressure suits or in masks all the time. And so those are the ones I think the endolons, yeah, endolons just got unlocked. And I don't know if we are adding another one. There might be another one coming. I have to check. Mm -hmm. So now. You had mentioned you had mentioned um you had mentioned anth you had mentioned um anthem when it came to one of your inspirations which what a, what a tragedy that what a tragedy project Dylan ended up being <laughs> yeah it's too bad um but given given that would it be fair to say that you're leaning more towards power armor than full on mecha yeah yeah for full on mecha I mean a lot of people once again it's a, it's an interesting term I always consider mecha to be Basically, anything that's uh, any robot you're a person's inside controlling, and that mm -hmm. could be anything from 10 to 12 feet tall to you know the size of a kaiju. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in Conestoga, there's two different types there are things called crutches, and the crutches are very much like the jackets from uh, uh, from uh, Edge of Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The idea of just being a powered exoskeleton that like we yeah. see in Elysium. And the idea is that there's about eight or nine different versions of these things. And they have different functions, and they're all modular. So you can slap modules on them the same way that you can create weapons from modules. Mm -hmm. And most of the players are going to be working with those uh, throughout uh, most of their lives. And eventually, at some point, they may get into these things called rigs. And these rigs are these extremely powerful, partially alien-based uh, powered armor, which are generally so advanced they're almost appearing magical and there's like I think three or it's like four or five versions of those mm -hmm. and um, they all have uh, very powerful weapons and they all can fly and uh, it's most of these are basically bes are bespoke they've been handed down uh, from uh, you know from from parent to child over many generations and so forth and there are these very small very rare things so very few players will actually have access to them and assuming mm -hmm. when you get to 15th or, or, or the 10th or 15th level that one or two players may actually have uh, one of these but they're they're kind of something that they're to shoot for these if someone has one they, there's a certain status for them just having them yeah and when you, when you mentioned these things being passed down one one of the things that immediately sprang to mind is, the mech warriors in um, BattleTech. Yeah, of course. For me, I haven't. I mean, I know BattleTech. Obviously, I'm, I'm a role player, so I've mm -hmm. grown up with BattleTech. But I, it's a strange one because I don't know much about BattleTech. It's always been around me. I've never, and I've actually, I've, I think I've played one BattleTech, but I never really knew what BattleTech was about, other than the fact that they were ripping off Dune and they just added Mecha in it. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, if, if there was anything that was blatantly ripping off Dune, it's Warhammer 40K, but that's but that's just me. But <clears throat> the but when it comes to when it comes to the um, weapon construction system, um, now obviously since you're not doing fantasy with this, um, a lot a lot of um, a lot of new we a lot of new weapons and equipment would have would have to be added from somebody jumping from one to the other, even even ta even taking. Um, ultra modern into account but 
tell me about the about the setup that you have, especially since you it mentions being able to create a thousand different firearms. I think the number is eleven thousand now, because we we yeah we're, it, we're, yeah, we're, it is we're, eleven thousand. We're, we're, we're unlocking the expanded modular system, so it probably is eleven thousand now. Uh, so it was inspired by Dead Space. Inspired means I basically mm. ripped off Dead Space Three. The idea is that. Uh, Weapons, there don't, there's no such thing as a gun. There's no guns in the setting. It's all about tools. And you pick up a frame, and there's, uh, I think, six or seven, no, I think there's maybe 12 or 13 types of frames now. Mm -hmm. And they either are light frames, and then there are med and there's, there's a light frame, and there's a, a, a heavy frame. I think there may be a medium frame as well. And they have a certain number of modules you can put in. And uh, the first module is a driver. It's basically the power source. What you know, what 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 kind of energy it requires. Whether it could be matter, could be energy, could be a type of plasma. Mm -hmm. There's like six different types of power, of power modules. You put it through an engine, and the engine converts it into something that's functional. Uh, and then you have a a, dr a, a, a a tip, a driver that you slap on the front that refines it into something cohesive. Mm -hmm. uh, and th since there are a dozen or so of these and a dozen of these and a dozen of these, there had to be a giant table that tells you every single combination of driver and module creates something unique. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, a so if you have a, a, a military driver, which is, which is the closest thing to a firearm, you add a precision driver, it's a sniper weapon. You put a, uh, co a convex, it becomes a shotgun. And so there's different modules that create different things. And it's not just that. There's you know javelin launchers, rail guns, uh, mines, rocket launchers, grenade, uh, sticky lightning. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a variety of melee weapons as well. And then on top of that, you can add uh, chips uh, uh, onto each of those modules that will then add more things you can add a lightning effect to a bullet you can add a slowing effect you can increase the rate of fire you can increase the amount of damage you can increase the range there's about 60 of those and then you can add additional modules that add other alternative effects uh, on top of that there's another 30 or 40 of those mm -hmm. so you add up those together you have 11,000 different combinations of weapons you can create yeah. and the thing is is that most of the time we have brand new loot tables, so when you're killing uh, a scab, you're not going to pull off a laser gun. You're going to say, well, we have a plasma driver, and that's all you can pull from salvage. And so you pull the convicts driver and go, oh, great, I can swap this into my weapon and turn it into a shotgun. Mm -hmm. So suddenly players have these options of swapping these items out and adding chips and basically creating new configurations based on what they want. Um, mm -hmm. There's even uh, taking the lead from Death Space, there's... Some of the heavier modules can have two weapons, so you can basically have two guns on top of each other. So you don't have to try to switch them. You can have a shotgun and a machine gun on the same uh, frame without having to switch them. Yeah, and I distinctly remember some people coming up with some bon some bonkers combinations in um in that entry. Um, yeah. I'm cur I'm cur I'm curious. Given 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 the different given the different type of combinations, if one if one of your players had set, had had um said, if you're at a um at a higher level that they wanted to they wanted to use this setup to essentially make the BFG, <laughs> um what sort what sort of components would they probably want to shoot for? Well, it would probably it, if if they want something that's a BFG, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a plasma driver, mm -hmm. and I can't remember the name of the actual tip. But there, there isn't anything like the BFG is a is an overpowered weapon for a reason. So in a fifth yeah. edition game, you would never give someone a BFG unless it had a finite lifespan. Uh, like for you know, uh, in one of my campaigns, I gave somebody a plus five plasma weapon at first mm -hmm. level, and he's like, "Well, that's an overpowered weapon. This is a plus five plasma pistol." Like, "Oh yeah, but it has eight shots, and you will never get a new clip." Oh. So he literally like, "Oh, this is a great gun. I have eight shots in my life." And I'm not going to get another clip until I'm 15th level, am I? I'm like, nope. So you have one, you have one weapon with eight shots, the plus five, so make them count. Uh, so, and that's a great way of, of of messing around with it. So there are super heavy weapons uh, that are predetermined, and VFG may be in that. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to make a BFG with modules, you would create something that's close, but not nearly as destructive as a BFG. You would yeah. go to the super heavy weapons for that. And uh, obviously, because there's no there's no way I'm gonna do the whole forty in, forty invisible tracers that the that the original BFG had, which was basically just hacked together logic. Um, yeah. 
if an, if if anything, I'd probably take the I'd probably take the approach that I've done that I've done in the past of um of put of putting in either very limited ammo or a lot of knockback, i.e. the noisy cricket method. Because yeah, I although need... the yeah the noisy cricket has popped up. I think the noisy cricket is an ultra modern actually, mm -hmm. not by name obviously, but yeah, just a really po a really powerful weapon that's go that is going to knock you on your ass. <laughs> yeah. Um. And um, and because of that, and I th I'm guessing that what you mentioned regarding that whole scab example that ties into the uh, loot the loot rules. Um, one of the, one of them possibly being loot tables, but what but what other changes would there be to how loot works in um in con in Constoga? Well, there's there's actually two sets of loot tables. Unlike mm -hmm. D&D, there's like one set of loot tables. There's two different loot tables in Conestoga. Mm -hmm. In the other games, uh, they have their own set of unique loot tables, but there's just one set. Conestoga has two sets because there's two ways to dish out loot. And it's entirely up to the GM. The first is to have them to have salvageable modules. Because like I said, no, there'll never be a point where, where the players will find a complete gun. Uh, they'll always find modules that they can slap together and give, uh, they'll get a frame and they'll have to find modules for it. So it's about scavenging, salvaging, and creating unique combinations. Mm -hmm. uh, the other loot table, however, is gives out just raw materials. And that was the other thing we did with the crafting system. We, we got inspired by kind of these loot shoot, the idea to have five or six, or in our case, I think 11 different universal compounds that if you combine in a very unique way it creates a lighter or a car and then and it's just it's a mountain combinations and mm -hmm. so we have bizarre you know unique compounds uh very common metals and so forth and so you can find raw materials and if there's an engineer in the party uh this is a very much a techie playground mm -hmm. you can grab those materials and in a much shorter span of time than in other games you can just build a frame or build a module or build a mech cuz every single thing in the game can be built if you have the raw materials mm -hmm. uh and sometimes like i said it may come down to players finding the raw materials storing them and then finally just building a mech entirely on their own so there's two ways to to play the game. You can just do it traditionally, finding modules, finding whole items, or it could just all be about engineers staying in a warehouse, bashing out unique and cool equipment. Yeah, I could I could see I could see some I could see some people who may, who may be veterans of say of say Necromunda getting getting some use out of out of a lot of the systems here. Oh yeah, well the whole point is that I wanted to create these systems, but they're not married to the system, uh, to mm -hmm. the setting. So players can and GMs can easily pull them off the setting and add them in to their own world. I mean, if they're, if if someone wants to create a dead space setting, um, you know, we have similar monsters in Ultra Modern. Take that, take the construction system out of Constoga, and boom, you've got you've got dead space. Now with one hundred percent less loot boxes. Oh no, you can do that too. I mean, you can totally have loot boxes in it. Uh, yeah, that's I, one of the things I'm I'm playing on is to <laughs> see how much I can make it look like a looter shooter because the looter shooter rules are in Ultra Modern Five, mm -hmm. and one of the things I might play with, depending if we hit stretch goals, is to add in more looter shooter ideas, right? But of course, in that case, loot boxes are free. You know, you throw yeah. out ran <laughs> like what is a random loot table than a random loot box? So you mm -hmm. you kill a monster. And then the box appears, but in the GM he goes, "Okay, you find these four items. That's a loot box." Is it wrong of me that if I that if I ever if I ever wrote a custom <laughs> loot table for my campaigns, I may end up calling it surprise mechanics? <laughs> yeah, uh, but that's one of the things is that uh, creating a, a I like the idea of actually having rarity. Uh, mm -hmm. Conestoga doesn't really play off of this, but it's an idea I might uh, work with later. Uh, especially with Taurus, which Taurus has another type of looter shooter mentality to it. It's mm -hmm. definitely the Conestoga, and playing with the idea that there's always this slim chance that some, a legendary item will drop, and our players can fight over who gets it. Mm -hmm. So, um, but when when it comes mm -hmm. to when it comes to Taurus, um, one of the one of one of the other one of the other things in its tagline is a post-apocalypse, which uh, much like how we mentioned with steampunk earlier, um, post-apocalypse is some is something that has a lot of um, a lot of assumptions, but also a lot of variance. Um, now, because unfortunately, a lot of people when they think post-apocalypse, they think 
zombies. Even though that's not always the ca that's not always the case. But what sort of po what sort of um where does the post apocalypse play in play into the world of Taurus? Well, Taurus is set in a, once again a manufactured world, an artificial world, mm -hmm. and uh, at some point about fifteen hundred years ago, it used to be covered in almost all of it was covered in a giant city, mm -hmm. and it was called it was called the Iocon Caliphate, and at some point it collapsed. It almost got turned to ash. It got almost completely destroyed. Uh, and no one really knows exactly how or why, but all, about the vast majority of it got destroyed. It's rubbles and ruins, there's deserts, there's mountains. There's a lot, you know, you know, there's areas that are under flood, but it's mostly just ruined. Most of the population got killed, and the remaining people fled into these smaller city states uh, called uh, called ex called enclaves. Mm -hmm. And they're basically just scattered across this habitat. And the only thing left over from this old uh, empire have been obviously dozens of of ruins. And hundreds of thousands of miles of still intact train tracks that were left over from this collapse. Uh, it's, 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 it's such a dense network that they almost create in some place called the tracklands, this open ocean of just crisscrossing railroad tracks. And that becomes this new genre because now everyone, instead of people traveling in cars or traveling in aircraft, it's all done by train now. And so... You have pirate ships, but instead of being pirate ships, they're pirate trains. Mm -hmm. And so it's all just train. And train uh, trains are very much a staple of steampunk, even if you don't have steam-powered trains. Mm -hmm. But that being said, if you go into the Pacifics, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's steam-inspired and steam-like, but there's also a lot of stuff that isn't. Like th some of these trains are very much newer 50s-style Art Deco trains that aren't really steampunk. They have this sleek bubbled chrome like exterior which is not a which is not a steampunk aesthetic mm -hmm. uh but so but once again it it makes sense within its own setting because of how it works i say it's steampunk forward but as i just said i use that more as a place marker to get people to understand the setting mm -hmm. if someone would ask me is that is this actually steampunk i went no technically it's not a steampunk most of the technology is run off something called a hydro cell which is a magical cell that ejects steam but is not a steam powered machine in a respect because steam does not create the energy required to do what steampunk claims it does. So I created a magical steam based technology called a hydro cell, which does the same thing. Yeah. Now, Taurus also, also is introducing three new races. What can you tell me about those? Yeah, these ones are, are, are definitely a bit freakishly weird. And because uh, once again, Taurus is 50, 50. So it's, it's got a, a kind of equal blend. There's a lot of techno fantasy, a lot of techno magic. So we have a couple of them. One of them is called the Lajanoid. The Lajanoid is, is I could saying it's a robot is, is not accurate. Really. It's an, it's, it's an artificially intelligent sentience um, that basically is, is able to create a body of itself out of garbage so it looks like a, it looks like a mound it looks almost like a shambling mound except it's mm -hmm. it's made out of garbage and it's intelligent so there's that one we also have uh oh effigy and the effigy are in the setting there's um there was a great disaster and a lot of people were killed but some of them didn't die so the effigy are effectively kind of like ghosts, but people aren't sure if they're actually dead or if not something happened to them and they're just out of phase. But the only way they can interact with our reality is by touching something called a totem, which is a, usually a device or, or some something. And they can only appear if they're touching it. So it's, 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 there's a mechanical balance to it as well, but it was always part of the setting. The fact that these things, uh, these, these people can only manifest in the real world when they're touching a totem. So they can't go ethereal and then invade a base and then do something and grab something and steal it. Because uh, unless they can bring that totem physically in, they can't they can't interact with the real world. And so that's the effigy. Uh, and then we have the zodiacs, and the zodiacs are zombies that are uh, in, like so they're sentient zombies inside powered armor. So the idea that at some point in the distant past, they they used they reanimated the dead, put them in powered armor, and sent them to do war. And some, a large number of them, when they uh, when they got reanimated, they reanimated with their consciousness and their memories, and they're like, "Well, I don't want to fight." And so they still are wandering around after 1,500 years. And uh, there's that one, and I think there is another one that we're working on as well uh, that may be added. Those are the those are the primary races. Yeah. Uh, in that setting. Now, it is now it is noted that you that you're introducing a new class, and I'm guessing that much like much like with Paradise, 
that new class is is primarily in, is primarily in there as a companion to the new spellcasting system. Yeah. So that yeah, that one um, Oxomancer. I'm not even sure where the name came from, but it's called an Oxomancer. And the magic the magic system in this setting is called Smoke. Um, obviously, a play on the whole steampunk, steam smoke, and so forth. Mm-hmm. And the idea that and this ma- this magic is very much a chaos magic. People become inhabited by smoke, and you'll you'll see things drifting from their eyes or smoke drifting from their fingernails, and that's because they've been they've been possessed by smoke. And because it's, it's steampunk inspired, they can use machines to bottle and harness and manifest smoke in very unique ways. There are little devices that they can make that can hold and use smoke in a magical way. But it's all about trying to control the chaos of this magic. And it manifests as a form of playing cards. So, And it's not ones that the character uses, it's the players. The player who plays an Oxomancer starts life with uh, the four aces, the four twos, the four threes. And that's their that's their starting deck Mm -hmm. and um as they play throughout the game they can it becomes a deck builder they can add specific cards they can remove cards if they want to to take out some of the cheaper cards and have more powerful cards when they go to cast a spell they draw a card that tells them their power they can pick their spell from that uh, from that power rating uh, the vast majority of spells have different effects depending on their power rating. So if you want, if you want to cast a fireball, and you draw a four power, you can create a four power fireball. Uh, if you draw out a ten power card, you can do a ten power fireball or some other thing, uh, other spell that you have access to. Uh, but the the face cards all have a, a function. So if you want to add face cards, face cards do specific things. So a king of diamonds does something different than a queen of hearts. And uh, the aces do something. You can have a favorite suit. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of poker terminology in, mm-hmm. in there as well. So even though it's a deck builder, you're trying to find ways of getting two. You, know, you get diff- additional benefits if you have a two of a kind. If you manage to pull out additional cards, you get three of a kind. So there's a bit of hand management as well. And then when mm-hmm. you do a short rest, you can bring some random cards into your deck. And when you complete a full rest, you can sh- reshuffle all of your cards back into your hand to start start again anew. So there's a lot of uh, new mechanics. I love the idea of bringing some things that people have learned from board game design. Mm-hmm. We use dice drafting in the civilian and ultra modern. And this is trying to play a magic system using... Uh, a deck of cards. So that was that was kind of our idea, uh, my idea going into the Oxomancer. That's a it's a it's a very chaotic uh, magic system that involves playing cards. It's definitely it's definitely not what I had ex- what I had expected when I re- when I went in when I read that because when somebody does word association about card based spell casting, the first thing that comes to mind is the Hucksters from the OG Deadlands. Yeah, somebody was mentioning that, and I was like, "Okay, I never heard of it." And then somebody came back to me and said, "No, it's nothing like that at all." <laughs> the only no, the huckster is is essentially playing a game a game of poker with spirits to have them do, have them do something for them. It, that something, of course, being their spells. Um, yeah. You're with this particular approach. That's not the case. But when you described the and when you described the car the um, card casting. Um, you made a you made a lot of reference to card to card value, um, the whether it be the whether it be the number of cards, whether it be the aces, whether it be the um, face cards. Is there a general theme regarding the effects that's tied to suits, or do suits not play as much of a factor in comparison to card value? Well, the card values dictate power. Right, so you know, if you have if you if you have a nine of 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 spades, it, you it, it, the, nine, the nine is 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 pretty powerful, mm-hmm. and the suit is based off of your character. You can choose a favorite suit in order to make some specific cards better, and then the 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 face cards are very unique. So there's you know there's sixteen suit sixteen face cards, um, and uh, or is it sixteen or twelve twelve face cards, and because the aces do something else. And mm-hmm. you can pick these things and add them to your deck, and that becomes your deck of cards. Mm-hmm. And each one does something. And because there's kind of a unique name of each card here before, and it's more, they're more in jokes and Easter eggs mm-hmm. rather than actual, you know, mechanical things. Yeah. Now, la- the last. Uh, the. Uh, now, when it comes to now, um, 
whenever it comes whenever it comes to campaign settings that are that are going with a different tech level than than core, there's always the issue of compatibility, um, especially when it comes to certain races, classes, or the or combinations of the two, and with it. Now I'm not I'm not I'm not throw, I'm not throwing in ultra modern into into this mix because that's a whole other can of worms obviously but are there in, are there any between within these three settings are there any core races or or um classes that would be trickier to fit than others? Nah, I always make I always write my system so they're compatible with core fifth edition. The whole idea is that you can take any element out and then insert it into your game, whatever it may be, and have it work. Mm -hmm. Ultra modern is modular that way. Affinity is modular that way. The races I did write so they were kind of they fit the setting. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's you know like you could you could you could muck around with the fluff and take them out and add them into your setting, but they're a bit more ingrained. But all the other mechanical stuff that's all basically designed to be 100% compatible with Core Fifth Edition. Yeah. So I'm, I'm guessing I'm guessing. F in the in the case of say um Conestoga, you've you've put you've put in something for the so that the more magically inclined races that are, that are in core could still fit in that yeah i mean you could you could easily have uh i mean the Endolons are very elf like mm -hmm. and in paradise there are there the, the humans have I mean, uh, humans have expanded throughout the whole world, and, and so they they actually have some physical different traits. So some of the like the Pyxis humans are very dwarf like, and so there, I we we played with the idea so you could kind of play non human races, but they're actually just humans. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the one of the combinations that immediately came to mind was, and this is the reason why I brought the whole the whole magic inclined ones is, say if somebody wants to play a tiefling in in Conestoga. Yeah, those, well, they could easily play another alien species. It's, 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 I mean, the setting doesn't have room for that, but it's if someone's making their own game, they could do what they want. Yeah. Um, when you say that, the the thing that instantly came to mind is how later um games in the Might and Magic series had aliens as um, demons as just a kind of alien. Yeah. Um, which I'm vastly simplifying, but um, Might and Magic is bonkers. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um. Now, when it com now, you had, you had met now um you had mentioned that originally these were these were going to be a, a hundred pa hundred pages um and and um since it's talking about six hundred plus pages at, on the Kickstarter page, I'm guessing that each of the each of them barring barring stretch goals is about two hundred pages each. No, it's gonna be way more than that. They're probably when, when we're done with the stretch goals and the. Artwork, I imagine, is going to be 230, uh, 240 pages each. So we're probably pushing 700. Yeah, and within e within each, do you ha and maybe maybe it was maybe it was mentioned in there, and I and I just um, didn't see it. But are there plans to implement a um, a sample adventure in each? Uh, that's a stretch goal because the core books got so big. Uh, like I said, at, at that you know, adding another adding a module is going to add another ten or fifteen pages, so that's going to mm -hmm. push us to two sixty or so. So I have to make sure that we've raised enough money in the campaign that the increased weight and production costs can be eaten by the profit from the campaign, and that's mm -hmm. the reason why we, we we left that out. If the campaign, if the books were like 180, 190 pages, then I would just add a module and like all the amethyst books always have modules because i always budget time for that mm -hmm. uh, but this one didn't that being said uh there's tons of things you can play with uh and i would like to include an adventure in each one but once again it's going to be a lot of excess content i want to add in i gotta get a map maker so i decided to leave that in as a, as a stretch goal all right i gotcha well with a with a well, I'm so I'm certainly going to be looking forward to to seeing how it um, plays out, and I've made I've made it. Cl I um in the interest of full disclosure, I did back at the at the um digital level to get up to get all three books. Um, that's what that's what I generally recommend. I mean, we did leave a pledge level for people to order single books, mm -hmm. uh, both physical or digital. I I always tell people I really don't think it's a good idea. You would only get one book if there's just some specific mechanical uh, mechanical set of rules that you want 
you're not interested in the setting, you just want like you just want the crafting system from Conestoga, or you just want the steampunk weapons from Taurus, uh, then I can see that. But if you're if you if you just like that setting, you want to play in that setting, go for all three because there's so much more value in reading all three books. Mm-hmm. And with with that in, with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here, and for sure. putting up with my, and for putting up with my um my gar- my garbage fire of of technical problems t- th- today. Yeah, it's all good, man. <laughs> um, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say okay. around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Oh, I could have been drinking all this time. <laughs> Son of a bitch! Oh, that, I'll just use that a... as just use that as the lead in for when you come back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Remind me next time, and I'll make sure I'll bring a, I'll bring a gin and tonic with me. We'll see. We'll see how rambunctious this gets. Oh, may, oh if we if we do it on if we do it on May the fourth, do I have do I have to retitle it a Qui Gon gin and tonic? Dude. <laughs> That's so <laughs> shitty. <laughs> I'm gonna tell my friend. I'm gonna tell my drinking buddy this like five seconds after I go offline. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna sit down on uh, May fourth and have Qui Gon gin and tonics. <laughs> yeah, it's it's that's like so that's like someone sharing a cursed image and then everybody goes, "That is completely disgusting." Right click, save target as. Yeah. But. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>